it's, it's lovely to be uh, with you in the room today, I have with so many amazing young leaders from across the globe who are in the room and many who are here with us virtually. It's delighted, always an honor to be a part of this uh, summit. Compounding crises have forever altered the future of work. The recent pandemic has accelerated ongoing disruptions to entire sectors and job types, driven by significant automation and digitization and underpinned by a very sharp focus on green transition. All this against the backdrop of economic volatility, a cost of living crisis, and ongoing geopolitical upheaval. The changes in the global economy, including the economic toll of the pandemic, are expected to leave millions out of work and even more at the risk of income loss. We know that many jobs will simply not exist and many people will have their income potential be cut down significantly. I looked at a recent LinkedIn data which shows that skill sets for jobs have changed by 25% since 2015 and by 2027, that number is expected to double. As many economies grapple with this paradox of higher number of unfulfilled jobs sitting alongside significant unemployment, organizations are struggling with intensifying war for talent, and individuals are continuously trying to adapt with an evolving workplace, ways of working, as well as expectations of work. As the labor market becomes a friendlier place for the highly skilled worker, and businesses adopt strategies to compete even more fiercely for this talent, it's the less skilled in the workforce who are more adversely impacted than before. Unless there is collective action and effort and investment in upskilling more widely, there is a very real risk of exacerbating the polarization in the society as workers who lack the advantages that come with specialist and scarce skills fall further behind. So, while many continue to give disproportionate attention to future-proofing businesses and economies, what is the role that each one of us play to inclusively bridge gap between education and employability, to future-proof the workforce, and to future-proof ourselves? What is the role of businesses in elevating the workforce segments who have been hit the hardest by the after-effects of the pandemic? How can we be investing in building and deploying skills so as to equitably lift participation across the workforce? And how do we then impact, extend that impact to the ecosystem? You know, supply chain, communities, also our clients. How can we better leverage workforce agency and activism to mobilize and accelerate real change in the space? One of the reasons why I'm here today. And how are we listening and supporting those with social barriers in building skills and accessing work? Poor education, mental health challenges, low income, disabilities, etc. These are just many of the questions that fascinate me. Over my almost 25 years now in business, both in retail and financial services, systemically bridging the gap between education and employment has been an area of massive personal passion. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here, surrounded by so much energy. Last night was amazing, by the way. Uh, directed towards a similar cause of driving sustainable change. Before I delve a little bit further on the topic of education and skill building, a little bit about Standard Chartered. We are a UK headquartered emerging markets bank. Uh, we've got presence across Asia, Africa, Middle East. We've been in business for 170 years, employ 100,000 colleagues in 50 markets, uh, serving 10 million retail small businesses, over 20,000 large corporates and FIs. Given our heritage and our footprint, we are really at the forefront of some of the biggest challenges facing the world today. Climate change, economic participation, and globalization. And we have a very clear purpose to take a stand on these issues. So our purpose is to drive commerce and prosperity through our unique diversity, and we have taken very clear stands in the areas of lifting participation, um, resetting globalization, and accelerating net zero. 
All of this provides me and my colleagues a unique platform to make an impact and to be able to do that at scale. Coming to the topic of education and skills, the challenge is clear. You know, I think there's huge data that presents the challenge. But we also believe there is a definite silver lining. You know, I was sitting uh, in the green room uh, listening to the panel before me and was so inspired by um, some of the young people who are really being innovative in the way they are thinking about uh, education and skill building. Jojo's story and experience around coding was particularly inspiring. So there is a lot of creativity around skill development that has been sparked by the pandemic. Education training providers are using innovative solutions and establishing unique partnerships to deliver learning. The experience of the pandemic has really underscored the need for education and training systems to become much more agile and responsive to the changing world of work. And the renewed focus is yielding results. You know, there, there's clearly some progress that's being made. The World Economic Forum has estimated the need and has committed to reskill a billion people by 2013. But that's not going to be enough. I, I think and that comes to this idea of how are the businesses going to be partnering with governmental agencies and educational institutions to drive this change. And I mean, my view is that to really drive sustainable impact, we will have to develop real-time feedback loops between labor markets and skill development systems, especially when it comes to disadvantaged groups. Women, minorities, uh, people with disabilities, displaced populations, there is a real need to eliminate barriers, multiple barriers, that prevent them from acquiring the skills they need for a more sustainable and a productive career. Data clearly shows that women and other underrepresented groups are most uh, disproportionately more likely to be impacted by the long-term uh, effects of the pandemic. And without targeted skill building, there is a real challenge for the gender balance to worsen. And I can see that definitely in financial services, which is the sector I'm representing uh, today. We did a piece of work in Standard Chartered a couple, of few, a couple of years ago. We did a strategic workforce plan where we looked at jobs that will disappear over the next three to five years and jobs that will be created. I mean, the data was fascinating. I mean, there were about 13 and a half thousand jobs that we would need less of uh, in the next three years. And these jobs were in areas like operations, sales support, administration. Interestingly, there were 9,000 new jobs that were going to be created in cloud engineering, cybersecurity, UX design, change management. Very conveniently, we called them sunset and sunrise job. When we did a gender overlay on how the skill set in the workforce will change, it gave us some pretty alarming results. So over a period of three years, the percentage of women in our workforce will go down by 2%. And the number becomes actually very stark when you go five years and beyond. And it's pretty obvious why. We've got far more women in sunset jobs and not enough women in sunrise jobs. There are not enough women in STEM. There are not enough data scientists, cybersecurity professionals, uh, not enough female technologists. So this idea that unless some very concerted action is taken by us in the company, the work that's been done to drive a level of gender balance within the company, we are 50-50 men and women across our workforce, is going to be undone um, very, very rapidly. What this study did for us it became a starting point for a conversation around build versus buy and the economic impact of decisions around upskilling and reskilling. So how much would it cost to hire into sunrise jobs and exit the, those in sunset jobs versus reskilling people from one category to the other? Just for interest, it's 49,000 US dollars for us. It's 49,000 US dollars cheaper to reskill somebody into a sunrise job as opposed to hire externally. What this also do, did, not just that it built an economic case, which, which does get a lot of bankers very excited, it also helped us create a real discussion on the opportunity uh, to start viewing the workforce around skills. So start thinking about skills available across our workforce, not just the jobs that people do or the educational degrees that they possess. So for us, uh, you know, for our colleagues, and actually all of us in the room, 
it underscores the massive urgency to not just continuously upskill and reskill to future proof, but to look at our experiences much more from a skills perspective. And now those skills could be skills that we have built over our professional career, you know, early careers and, and moving on, or it could be skills that you acquire as per as part of all the side hustles that we that, that you do. And I'm I'm aware I speak to Gen Zs and Gen Y in our company that having a side hustle is a given part of life today. And so when you think about skills, it's not just what you're doing at work, it's also the, the stuff that you're acquiring by the, the areas of interest or the gigs that you have in your personal life. So the days of jobs for life are long gone, we know that, but increasingly, the real conversation is whether even the concept of jobs will continue to exist as a, as a norm. And, and my strong view is that actually skills are going to become the currency of work. I say this to my team very often, we stopped being the custodian of jobs a long time ago. We are actually the custodian of skills. Just want to share some practical examples of things we are doing in Standard Chartered, hopefully to stimulate some thinking. As an organization, we said we've got a very strong sense of purpose, and we know we have a role to play in bridging the gap between education and employability. We've done a lot of external research, internal consultation, to identify the key skills that will be needed for the future of banking. And we club them into both technical skills uh, to embrace disruptive technologies, data, digital, information security, cyber risk, etc. And perhaps even more importantly, human skills to deliver what technology and machines are not going to be able to do. Managing ambiguity, resilience, uh, critical thinking, leadership. And what we are doing is we are helping our colleagues build a learning habit around both technical and human skills. So pivot towards these skills and make learning accessible in a very creative way to all of our colleagues. We are underpinning all of this with an internal gig economy where colleagues can post and sign up for gigs in addition to their day job. It could be signing up for something that you're good at and want to practice or something that you want to reskill into. More than 26,000 colleagues have been able to access almost 18,000 projects, often cross-functional, many times cross-geography. And while as an organization we've been able to untap the latent productivity and innovation in the company, it's also helping our colleagues identify work that is aligned to their purpose. You know, answering the why I work, which to my mind is as important as when I work and where I work. I mean, my favorite story, which I quote very often, is from India, where our colleagues in consumer banking wanted to build a blueprint for rolling out deaf-friendly banking across the market. The core team knew that to build out this proposition, they need a range of skills, many of which they didn't have. So this included tech skills, to review our existing platforms, client experience skills to look at gaps, risk management, project management skills to look at end-to-end -end design delivery, and finally, brand and marketing skills to build a go-to-market strategy for the proof-of-concept solution. Instead of asking for additional headcount and budget, which in a large corporation is extremely painful, the core team decided to use the internal marketplace to crowdsource the skills needed to deliver this program in a very ambitious timeline. So there was a colleague from, with a communications background who signed up for the gig. We had somebody with, uh, who was a UAT manager who bought skills in cloud computing and quality assurance. A, quali a colleague from our tax team who had prior audit and process documentation experience joined in. Uh, we had somebody who came in with much more of a DNI experience. We really needed some real expertise around diversity and inclusion. And all of that was crowdsourced. Colleagues came together to work on this project, everyone based in another part of the world, doing a core job which had got nothing to develop a, a product around deaf friendly banking. Within four months, not only did we launch the product in India, the team was able to develop a blueprint which we could take to many of our other markets. Aptly, thank you. Aptly, 
This gig has been titled Breaking the Silence on Our Marketplace. And I have to say, I, I love the title as much as, as the project and what it has uh, delivered. So look, technology has been discussed a lot yesterday, today, you know, we firmly believe, I firmly believe technology is really key to being able to drive any kind of scale uh, if you want to, to, to embark on this reskilling agenda. Um, you know, the perils of AI have been long discussed and, and signposted. We think if used well, AI can really help uh, drive this agenda. You know, our learning platform, our talent marketplace is all AI enabled. In 2002 alone, we had over 75,000 colleagues actively learn on the platform. Um, you know, the technology is a bit like Netflix. You, you consume, uh, you, content gets curated on the basis of what you consume and your interests. We've also had almost 28,000 colleagues access Future Skills Academy. For us now, the interest is much beyond just our colleagues. You know, we believe that as a purpose-driven business, we need to take the impact beyond our colleagues into the communities within which we work. Our Future Makers program leverages our expertise as a bank and works through staff volunteering and local partners to help the next generation learn, earn, and grow. Through this program, we've been supporting disadvantaged young people to learn new skills, to enhance employability, and to enable entrepreneurship. I mean, some of the numbers we have are very impressive. Since between 2019 and 2022, we've had 1 million young people, 74% of whom are women, benefit from the program and, and have been able to enter the workforce. So really bridging the gap between more formal education and, and employability. And, and the program is around not just vocational skills, but also giving them broader business skills, financial literacy, and also social skills to be able to enter the world of work. Finally, uh, my sort of call of action, uh, call to action, it's been really encouraging uh, being here yesterday evening and this morning to see many businesses such as ours investing massively to create a learning culture and enabling skill building that is customized to micro preferences, massively important, but also aligned to macro skills requirement. And, and that's the power of technology. You can hyper-personalize to individual preferences, but you can do it keeping in mind the macro requirements for skill building within industry and within societies. Talent is a key to competitive advantage of businesses. Businesses cannot afford to be left behind as employees are willing to walk away if employers do not invest in them. At the same time, being able to deploy these skills that colleagues have, that workers have for one job into another is continuing to become even more relevant if we are to try and solve this massive challenge around labor movements and, and, and the growing disparity between skills. The choices made by business leaders, policymakers, and educational providers today will shape economies for generations to come as will the choices made by workers and learners. It is a, there are two sides to this coin. You know, each one of us have a massive role to play. It is more important than ever before for stakeholders to come together, listen to those most affected, and identify creative solution to support the next generation learn, earn, and grow. If any of this excites you as much as it excites me, please do reach out, partner with us, you know, let's help the, uh, shape the future together um, across uh, many, many dynamic markets in, in the world. Equally, and this is a pitch from my recruitment team, if any one of you are interested in a career in Standard Chartered, you know where you can find us. Thank you very much. It's a real honor and privilege to be able to speak to all of you today.